Uh, so we have seen this uh, paper from Hinton, no? We have two papers, well, one is from Hinton, the other is anonymous, but sure. Um, so, and apparently it was a bit complicated perhaps to understand, so I will try to explain uh, briefly uh, what it does, the paper, and then we try to see how we can implement this code in PyTorch. Um, so let's get started. Uh, capsules and routing techniques. So, uh, why do we need those capsules, right? Um, for the moment, CNN can actually deal with translation. But if you'd like, for example, to deal with other kind of affine transformation, uh, this might be an issue. Why is that? So we can think about a neural net as like a classic like logistic, logistic uh, base neural network. So every, every nonlinearity is a logistic function. Okay? So if you think about this kind of very classic neural network, you can think about every activation as the value of a specific feature extractor. So you can think about a neural net as a feature extractor uh, ensemble. And every activation represents the probability of seeing that specific feature in the input. Okay? Does it make sense so far? All right, good. So we can deal with uh, translation because we use max pooling. So uh, if things are slightly moved around, we max pool and then we kind of lose track of inform about the uh, translation. So uh, convolutional nets are uh, inherently able to deal with translation. But what about all the other transformations? What about like rotation, stretching, and shear, all the other kind of affine transformations? Uh, so we can, do, we can deal with those in two uh, ways, and we actually ver are very aware about this. Uh, the first way is actually uh, having very deep networks and very wide networks, right? Why does this deep, 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 deep neural network work very well? Because they have plenty of feature extractor, right? In this way, they can account for all the kind of uh, fine transformation that are not just the translation. All right, so far? Okay. Uh, the other way, what's, what's the other way we can deal with uh, other kind of affine transformations? What do you need when you do deep learning? Data. Yeah, a lot of data, right? That's the, our curse. We, we need to have an exponentially um, large amount of labeled data, uh, which, okay, is not too bad because we can augment data, but still, we need a lot of uh, detectors in order to account for these transformations and a lot of actual examples in order to have the network to train their own parameters, right? So these are kind of two bad points about uh, standard convolutional nets, which capsules actually will try to fix. So what can, how can we fix? We simply have to efficiently encode a viewpoint invariant knowledge, right? Big terms, but we'd like simply to learn uh, some kind of representation that doesn't care about the specific instantiation of whatever you're looking at. You'd like to extract the 3D underlying uh, object from that kind of 2D view, right? All right, so uh, capsules. Uh, what are those fancy capsules? They are simply groups of neurons characterizing an entity in an image. <coughs> so really, it's very easy here. It's simply a bunch of neurons together, finish. So you have a neural network, just make a drawing around some neurons with a pencil, that's a capsule, right? No, no, no hard thing. Um, no, no, also don't think about non-linearities, just a couple of activations, like linear output of the, uh, like the matrix times your vector of the previous layer, then you make a circle, that's a capsule. Cool, huh? <laughs> okay, let's go on. Um, so why do we care? We'd like every capsule, which is representing a specific entity, to be able to tell us something about the specific entity they are trying to represent. For example, those properties may include pose, deformation, velocity, albedo, hue, and texture. Okay? So every capsule has a couple bunch of activations which are characterizing that specific entity with different properties. So just a lot of words, but nothing here, right? So it's just groups of neurons. Uh, what's the role? Why do we need this stuff? So uh, in this way, if we can have these kind of captures with our, which are uh, trying to <coughs> understand about the presence, about specific, uh, trying to characterize a specific entity in the, uh, in the input scene, we can try to invert the rendering process. 
what the heck does inverting the rendering process mean? Let's see. So basically, from a 2D camera projection, we'd like to infer the 3D abstract model that generated the specific view. Still fancy to kind of weird what I said. You can say, huh? I can understand it from your face that it's kind of funky. So I, can, I put a drawing here. So basically, from the picture of a teapot, we'd like to reconstruct its perhaps geometrical representation, right? So this is kind of intuition behind this stuff. We'd like to infer what is the actual entity of which we see a example here. All right, so this is enough with text. We see how this is done, because uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward as well. So um, we have here, a, every capsule can be represented with a vector. The uh, angle of this vector represents the property of the specific uh, item we are looking at. Um, also, another uh, specific <coughs> way of representing those capsules are basically that we are using the length of this vector to represent the probability of finding some specific um, entity in the input uh, or in the previous um, layers. <coughs> so once more, uh, we can think about these capsules as like bubbles. I like to think about bubbles. And then you have this kind of vector. The length of the vector represents the probability of finding that specific capsule entity. And the orientation of the vector characterizes the, the statistics, the, the, the characteristics of that specific entity the capsule is trying to model. Okay? So if the capsule tries to model something which is not present in our uh, input image, what does it do? What do you think is going to happen? It shrinks down to zero, right? So the length of the vector is going to be just disappearing. And it actually does. I mean, I'll show you after the examples, and it's just ridiculously amazing how it works. I mean, it works well. So we said the norm represents the probability. So what's, uh, how can I enforce this to be a probability? It has to be in the range of zero one, right? Yeah, sure. I, sorry, I, I, like to, I usually teach uh, undergrad, so I, I, yeah, OK, you know. Whatever. <laughs> so basically, we use a squashing function. That is our nonlinearity here. Um, the input to a capsule is the uh, s, the vector s j, and then this is the squashing. Basically, uh, it renorms it uh, to have it at max norm at one, norm one, and at minimum goes to zero. And it, the norming factor, of course, doesn't change the direction. Okay, so it, j it simply changes the magnitude of the vector. All right. So let's see how um, where this S come from, right? So first of all, we have this uh, VJ, which is a capsule, capsule J. Uh, it get, gets its input from the uh, SJ, which is the input to the capsule. Um, how do we compute this SJ? So SJ, which is the capsule input, it's simply a weighted average of those U hat, which are expressed uh, soon. So those U hat here, you add, attribute some weight to each of those vectors. So all of these uh, bubbles are vectors, right? Cs are scalars. Okay. Uh, here, the capsule is just V, because the capsule has the unitary norm, right? So my V is the capsule, which gets its input from the S, which is like a non-normalized capsule. And we normalize it to get that thing out there. Uh, the non-normalized non non input of the capsule, it's simply a weighted average of other vectors which are not yet capsules, are unnormalized, non-normalized capsules. And that yeah. use are unnormalized capsules. Be you see the, uh, the arrows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are wider than the circles. I spent some time making those drawings. The v v v <laughs> VJ is a capsule though, right? Aha, uh -huh, VJ is a capsule because you squash it. So, 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 so why is the arrow smaller than the... Uh, oh, because it's a... It's a probability. Between zero and one. And correct. And one. You just join later. Yes, that's correct. All right, so far, good, right? Good. Um, questions? No questions. Okay. What the heck is those? Uh, are those U hat? So U hat are the prediction vectors, which are generated from the capsules of the layer below. So and find those are capsules. U I yeah. are the capsules here, because <coughs> the arrows are within the circle. Awesome. Yay! Also, you can you can see the orientation of those uh, vectors are different from the orange layer <coughs> to the purple layer. Also, that took some time. Uh, 
And you, of course, apply a linear transformation and you get some kind of rotation and scaling and whatever, right? So, uh, reiterating, going from the bottom to the top <coughs> of the architecture because neural networks start from the bottom and they go up. If you draw it on the other side, I'm going to bite you. <laughs> Seriously, don't draw networks upside down. So, I have a question. Um, the u sub 1 till the u sub i, those ones are used for all the capsules in the next area. Which one? Right? You? The, the orange ones. The orange ones are the capsule of the layer below. Yeah. So those ones are used uh, to generate for, for all the other capsules. Yeah. So they are used for different capsules. But the purple ones are only used for, for one capsule J. J because okay. you, it's written J given I. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So from the bottom capsules, which are the layer, the first layer, we apply a linear transformation, which is somehow uh, scaling, rotation, some sort of operation. Then from the uh, prediction vectors, we apply routing, which is basically averaging them out using those coefficients c, i, j. And then we get the input to the capsule layer j, which is going to be uh, providing the capsule uh, output after the squashing. All right, next one. So this is how we learn this stuff. The w parameters, we are going to be learning them by backprop. And what about the C? So C are fancy. So let's look at those C. Um, C CIJ, and this is the dynamic routing um, part. So here I will na name my uh, green layer L plus 1, and the purple layer, I will just lay, uh, name it layer L. Uh, in specific case, I will call SL the size of the layer L. So how do we get those uh, CIJ? At the beginning, we just initialize some uh, vectors bi with zeros for every uh, capsule in the layer L. Then we get a softmax of those b's. So given that they are all zeros, c's are all one above the number of uh, capsules in the layer L plus one. The softmax is taken over the j components. So that's that's so so. If you take ci and sum over j, so cij sum over j is equal to 1. So that each capsule will go to something like one of the uh, next layer capsule. Yeah, it's important because this is saying that each lower light layer capsule is going to one upper layer capsule. That's what you want, right? You don't want it to go to multiple ones. That's what this is reinforcing. So it should be the sum over j, which is a higher level capsule. Then we, p we compute the input to the capsule as the weighted average, which is simply an average here. There is no weighting. So it's just a, well, yeah, an average of all the uh, predictions. Then we apply the squashing in order to get the output of, of every capsule in the layer uh, L plus 1. So we, we perform this operation, the, the uh, average input, the average summation, the average weight and the squashing for every capsule in the layer L plus 1. <laughs> and at the end, we update our uh, logits with the, um, with the projection of the prediction and the output of the capsule. Finally, we just repeat a couple of times. And after like three times, four times, this sh doesn't show any more uh, variation, uh, a strong variation over uh, this update. So I think it's, it's important to, like, to uh, to talk about the motivation of what this softmax is doing that will answer something. Yeah, the softmax is used in order to have, uh, to strengthen just the path from one capsule in the layer below to its own part. So it decides where to route itself through the network. In practice, when you run this multiple times, for each i, cij will turn, turn out to be very close to 1 for 1j, one and yes. the other ones will be close to 0, which is kind of like routing from one lower layer capsule to one upper layer capsule. But these CIJs are learned through this dynamic routing. I think that still it's important to know what this thing is doing is some sort of voting scheme. And then, so, so all the lower layer capsules vote for something, and then this V is the sum of those votes, and the capsule which has the most amount of overlap with the aggregate vote gets large. Like the C for that one becomes large. The other ones are suppressed. The ones that don't have a lot of over overlap with the aggregate of the books, which is the IJ. So VJ here. VJ is the output of the capsule. So V is a, here like in this case is a, is a writer that is impressed by just one uh, index that is J. 
So you go on next slide. Now suddenly V is a is an instinct that is indexed by two things, by K and I. So for the example I, I have my input X I, my uh, Ah, so this is now it's it's the training set? Yeah. yeah. This is for training, yeah. Okay. So I'm training, I'm providing one example. I have an input and I have a label. If the label, um, if we are at the okay. index with the cor uh, corresponding to the correct label, yes. we are going to have the first part, okay? The first, the first yes. row of this loss. Okay. If we are on the index which are not corresponding to the uh, label, we are having yeah. the second one. So we have one of the first and nine of the other. Okay. This loss tries to boost the norm of the correct capsule up to 0.9, if it's the, co the positive margin, for example, and it tries to squash down the uh, capsules of the, wrong, um, of the wrong labels down to uh, at least 0.1, if the negative margin is 0.1, okay? So you, if you are larger than 0.9, the first part goes to zero. If you're below 0.1, for example, if in the, in the wrong capsules uh, index, they are also going to be zero. So the loss function is going to be positive only if you are in the wrong, uh, in the, you have a wrong uh, predictor, right? In a, the wrong margin, a wrong probability. Is the capsule going to have the same number of capsules as the number of classes? Yeah, so there are as many output cala um, capsules as the number of classes. And each capsule norm represents the probability of observing such capsule. Moreover, if you check the characteristics of this capsule, the ang angle, you're able to reconstruct the input. And the final margin loss is going to be simply the summation of all, over all the outputs. Okay? In the case that the uh, correct capsule is larger than 0.9 and the wrong capsules are below 0.1, the summation is going to be just zero. Okay? Does it make sense? So this thing. All right. All right, so let's see how, what is the architecture. Here we provide a input xi to the network. We have a convolutional, net, uh, we co we have a convolutional block, which is simply uh, massaging the input. And then we have two layers of caps capsules. We have a primary capsule, which is a convolutional capsule. And the other one is the digit caps, which are uh, like um, uh, with the matrices, not with the uh, with convolutional parts. So the first, the center part is a convolutional Kernels, the right one has uh, simply matrices. Uh, moreover, in order to enforce that each output capsule is able to represent completely the input, um, there is also a reconstruction loss which is uh, added to the total loss. So the output, the 10 output uh, capsules, they are masked but one, but the correct one. And then from the correct capsule, we try to um, have a uh, three layers MLP, and then you try to reconstruct the input image. This is the loss he's talking about. So the final loss overall of the system is going to be a summation of the margin loss plus a fraction of this reconstruction loss. Anyhow, the row here is very, 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 very tiny. It's one over 10,000, I think, or something like that. Okay. All right, so th these are the results of the paper so far. Uh, so here we have the first row is the input uh, to the network and the below output is going to be the output of the reconstruction. So we can see that the label, so the three numbers on top are, represent, um, are relatively, um, respectively, sorry, label, prediction and reconstruction. So for example, in the second uh, column, we see that an input is the number five and then the reconstructions actually acts like is a regularizer and it removes the uh, extra pin. Uh, moreover here, the tail of the five, which is like curly in the top uh, row, which is the input, is completely uh, smooth in the output. For the third column, we have the, the gap of the top of the eight is closed. And also here, there is a kind of glitch, uh, glitch which is also uh, recovered. Finally, let's see how, uh, what's happened when the wrong prediction is made. So for example, in the uh, second last column, we have that we input a five, which has a small segment on top, which is uh, interpreted as a three instead. But the network is, if the network is forced to reconstruct a five, it will actually reconstruct a five. On the other side, with the same input, but uh, the 
reconstruct reconstructed um, character, the reconstructed digit is actually three, the network will remove the top right segment in order to make it look like a three. Okay. All right. So here are some of those results. Uh, the one that I like the most are uh, the following. So this one, we see that the dimension of those output captures can parameterize the thickness of the digit. And another one, which is uh, another dimension, for example, can characterize like a specific style of writing a number. Uh, finally, this is another uh, experiment they have done. So they've input two digits, one above each other. So there are two digits on the same uh, image overlaid. So the, the, the first row and like the, the top rows are the overlaid inputs and the bottom rows for both cases here are representing the reconstructed inputs. So for example, let's see top left, we have two and seven. So there is a two and seven in the original image and the network uh, correctly classify two and seven, and it generates two and seven even though the seven has a segment that is overlapped with the number two. Same for the, let's say, third column, we have the six and eight, which I really have difficulties seeing them, and they are both correctly uh, classified, and then the reconstruction so shows you that even though they are overlapped, they can, the network can nicely uh, draw those two symbols. They cheat a little bit in training this because when they are reconstructing, the final reconstruction loss is, uses the separate images. Yeah, so. I know. <laughs> but st still, it, I, I don't know, it's still like, it looks to me amazing the fact that although they are overlapped, it still is able to yeah. figure out. Why do you find it surprising? Because it can tell, well, it can draw those overlap, overlap pixels, it can actually assign them to both classes. And in the next case, I'm going to show you very soon, if the, all those pixels are not present, the network will refuse to actually generate the output. Let me show you. So here instead um, are some uh, misclassifications. So in the first point, we, we have a 2 and an 8, but the network predicts 2 and 7. And here you can see, if you ask to reconstruct 2 and 8, it will reconstruct 2 and 8. And if you try to reconstruct, two and seven, it will also reconstruct uh, two and seven. But the, the part that I liked, it, it was this one. So uh, if, you, if you are actually inputting a five and a zero, and you ask to reconstruct five and a seven, the network will actually complain, it will not reconstruct the seven. It, you see that kind of uh, cloudy region there. The input are, is the, the mixed image, the, the image with the two digits. Okay. And then for the reconstruction, the reconstruction is done with the separated, separated so, digits. So then, um, so, so, then it's, I mean, so you train with the loss, the margin loss, with two of those are correct and right. the other are wrong. And then the reconstruction is done with separate, like, uh, separate digits. It does seem like your point about the generative model thing, though. I mean, you're basically you're teaching a generative yeah. model, so it's it has to come up with some representation of the thing that's gonna has to map to twos or whatever. So, so in that sense, uh, it's just kind of pattern matching twos mm -hmm. and it's up to the mix of thing. But still, if you don't have those features, so given that the, the zero has been, for example, never, so the seven has never been seen, so the capsule representing the zero will have a very small norm, and therefore it is going to be showing you a very faded result. Uh, 